And if you've been, if your sleep's been shot for several years and you've got something that works, you just want to tell everyone, right? <laughs> and so we started telling people, they started getting some results and, and uh, we've, uh, she doesn't need it today. I tell people, you only use a herb for as long as you need it. Okay, now the, you can, there's no harm in taking it. I mean, just for nutrition, you can still take it. It's, it's not going to do any damage. Uh, there's certain herbs that you can take the rest of your life. Um, and they're not going to hurt you, okay. But generally speaking, you just take herbs as long as you, you need it. Once the imbalance is corrected, then you can come off them. All right. Um, so that really got a, attention. And then uh, another herb, which my wife used for hormonal balance, was Vitex. Uh, or do you want me to write down the board? Okay. Um, okay. Vitex. Okay, I'll give you the botanical name, which is just an extension. Vitex agnus castus is its botanical name. It also. Um, has another name of chaseberry or monksberry, monks pepper, cloister pepper, it's all the same thing. Um, it was used in monasteries anciently, that's why it was called monksberry, to control the libido of uh, monks. But don't worry, it's, it's a normalizer. Sorry to mention libido so much, it's just the, it's just the herbs, okay? Just the herbs that we... Because so you, you come across. <laughs> <laughs> no, this. Uh, by the way, men shouldn't really be taking this so much. Men, ch ch yeah. yeah, yeah. I wouldn't recommend it for men. It's more for women, okay. Unless you're a monk, okay. Then you may take. But this is a a hormonal normalizer. It works on the hypothalamus pituitary axis that governs the whole lady's reproductive hormones, the luteinizing hormone follicle stimulating hormone and gonadotropic hormones and especially the luteinizing hormone because that's what is involved in progesterone secretion. All your hormones come from progesterone, whether it be estrogen, testosterone, it all is manufactured from progesterone. So Chase Berry, yes? Do you have a oh, I'm sorry. photo of the plant? Do I have a photo? Because we might be calling it another name in our area. Okay, yeah, it looks very similar. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, this is it here. Okay, so I'll pass it around. That is the berry. That's the berry. Now, you do have them at Uchi Pines. I was told that. Um, you have Chase, you have Vitex here, right? So, okay, so yes. So, all the trees of Uchi Pines are going to be demolished by the time we finish with this. Um, yes. Yes, I'll tell you what this is good for, okay? This is excellent. My wife was having two out of four weeks PMS symptoms. Okay, so this is excellent for PMS. Cramping mood swings due to hormonal fluctuations, okay, um, pain, uh, it's good for amenorrhea, it's good for dysmenorrhea, so, uh, it's, it's helpful for fibroids, if you've got fibroids, it can help with that, um, it can help with endometriosis, okay, um, it also helps with fertility, okay, um, now I'm not saying you'll get pregnant if you take it, but I'm also saying I'm not saying that if you do you won't. All right. <laughs> and um, yeah, you this this really really is effective. If you I mean if you want to look at a fertility herb, if one thing, if you want to get pregnant, this is excellent to take. Okay. Oh no, it's different. Oh, is it made? You mean? Oh, I'm sorry. Is it made the same way? You can um, berries. Berries are better decocted, so you bring it to a boil and let it simmer for 20 minutes. Okay. So, yeah. Yes. Well, they have an issue taking the oat straw. 
I've never had anyone have an issue with oat straw. Okay, now here's the thing about oat straw. My wife was taking oats, didn't touch a sleep. But when she started taking the oat straw, she started getting results. So that shows me there is uh, a much higher nutrition in the straw than there is in the oat itself. Yes, sir. That, that's it, the, the Vitex. Vitex is very good for fibroids. So she started taking Vitex, and that's when uh, she got pregnant two occasions. Um, and if anyone's in the medical field, if you're per perimenopause at 34 and have a second child at 43, it's unheard of, right? And I, I know every child's a miracle, but um, really, really is an <laughs> extra miracle. <laughs> um, so uh, that de did away with all the PMS issues. I mean, she didn't have, after, the, after she started taking Vitex, all that two weeks of PMS, it just disappeared. Month after month, it was, was not showing up. She was just getting really good results Sorry. with that. What is premenstrual oh. syndrome? What, five, well, my wife didn't have fibroids, but we've used it for people who've had fibroids and they've had good results taking it. Yeah, okay. So, um, now, when we had our first child, um, we didn't, we followed the current medical literature that said don't take Vitex um, when you're pregnant and when you're lactating. Okay, that's the standard, you know, medical advice. Um, but we wish we hadn't sort of followed that advice because she ended up with a really bad case of um, post-traumatic shock. Post-traumatic shock. Um, she, she had a, a very long labor. Um, she had exhaustion. You know, and that's the danger about having a long birth. It's, it's not just so much the pain, even though the pain is terrible, but the exhaustion and the effects after that. And um, so she, uh, she had a really bad recovery from our first child. And she went into bad pe uh, post-traumatic shock. She was very, very depressed. And uh, the second time we used it for, after a second child, she went into the uh, PPD as well. And then she started taking the Vitex and it, she got out of it quickly. So it's really good to help with balancing. It's helpful for depression. So um, I'm not saying, I'm just putting it out there for you to keep in mind that a lot of the medical advice, and I, I'm not saying all herbs are safe during pregnancy, please don't misunderstand me. Um, there are a lot of herbs that can cause um, premature, um, what's the word now? Um, well, you get contractions for the uterus that you know, loses a child in the first trimester. Okay, so uh, you can get herbs that do that. They're usually the strong astringent herbs. Okay, but you could use herbs more in the last trimester, and those are herbs that could help with toning the uterus, helping with the delivery, um, and uh, relieving some of the pain, which is a big one, right? <laughs> so, in fact, we had. Uh, a formula that so far and we've given this out to quite a few people the longest labor has been three hours the longest labor has been three hours so um, even in first birth which typically is around 12 hours so in fact one lady she took so much of it I think she she, she had it in the delivery waiting room she just the just baby just flew out <laughs> anyway some of these things you got to be careful when you recommend because some people think well, if, if, if a little bit is good, therefore a lot's better, and you know, let's take a bottle of it, that <laughs> would be okay. Um, so uh, then also we had uh, issues with our children uh, with the uh, immune system, and uh, I wish you could, you know, hind um, hindsight is always uh, wiser, isn't it? But. Um, we did the best we could because she couldn't breastfeed at the time. She had Raynaud's of the breast. So that means she got vasospasm. 
of the breast so the milk couldn't let down. And so we had to rely on, we were wobbled at the time and we used some formula. I didn't realize at the time it was also genetically modified from soybeans. So that really mess, messed him up even, even more. And there's no substitute for, for mother's milk, of course. But um, so we started seeing some really bad reactions in him and he was getting sick uh, regularly like every month and he'd be sick for like two, three weeks at a time. And so, like, there's got to be an answer. There's <laughs> got to be something we can use. And that's when we uh, turned to elderberry. Um, and this really helped with the immune system. And it doesn't stop you getting sick, but it does definitely cut down the duration of the sickness. This is really good for colds, for flus. Uh, strength it helps with the immune system, upper respiratory tract problems it's really good for that so we started seeing results with our children and um, then people say can you make this for us can you do that and what's good for this and ended up now we're full-time herb ministry and uh, we're just opening a store next week in Michigan a herb store and a herbal cafe and so uh, pray for us we <laughs> It's our first time we've opened a store, so we uh, we uh, we trust the Lord is going to bless. Um, and so now we teach uh, herbal remedies is the main thing I teach now. And um, anyway, any anyone got any questions on what I've covered so far? Yes, yes, ma'am. I think I got so the, okay. the Vitex. You uh -huh. can take it during pregnancy. We decided to do that. Yeah, and. Third that was after the, um, hang on, where was it? No, sorry, that was in lactation. That was in lactation. Yeah, so just after the birth. Just after, just birth. after birth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But traditionally, midwives have used it during pregnancy. That's how it's been traditionally used. All right. Uh, often the reason they say the things they say is not because we have clinical evidence that it's toxic, but just because of lawsuits. That's the bottom line. Yeah, but if in doubt, it's better to leave it out, you know, and usually there's something that you can, um, and maybe later I can talk about pregnancy and herbs, what can be used. We could cover some of those things. Um, anyway, um, let me talk to you about... Um, some principles of herbal remedies. Did you have a question? Yeah, the last bottle that you picked up when you said it's good for colds and stuff. Oh, the elderberry? Elderberry. 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 Yeah, this is. That one is, made as a tea as well. Or I'm going to show you in the. Uh, I'm going to show you later on how to make elderberry syrup. Okay. okay so we're going to actually demonstrate how to use this. This is the Sambucus nigra variety, which is. Um, is not the one that we have outdoors. It's the same genus, but it's a it's a different variety. It's a it's basically the same thing, but you know you have different varieties of the same mother. <laughs> you know that's what it is. It's like a cousin, really. Um, it doesn't mean it's no good. It's just that the European elderberry or the Sambucus nigra is what they've done all the clinical studies on and that's showed to be very effective for colds and flus and um, that's the only one you can have raw. The other ones they recommend you cook because it's got some cyanide in the common elderberry that we have in America. And it's not necessarily going to kill you. Some people have no reaction whatsoever but um, berries are actually better cooked anyway. All right. So let me give you some basic principles of herbal remedies. Anyone taken a herb and didn't really do anything? Didn't see any difference? Maybe it made you worse? Any? So, some people here, right? Okay, okay. No one, and the rest of you haven't taken herbs, is that right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, um, there, there are reasons why herbs don't work, just as there are reasons why they work. Okay, so I want to give you some principles, and that way, if you can follow these principles, they'll help you to know how to be more effective. Because we're told 
and inspiration, the intelligent use of herbal remedies. So that means there's also an unintelligent use of herbs and I would, uh, I would like to mention to you that most people are on the unintelligent program. It means they're not really using them the way God intended them to be used. Um, so, herbs, uh, like foods, they have a shelf life and so they go old. And so, um, light destroys herbs and moisture, humidity, um, oxygen destroys herbs. So, the best way to store your herb is to um, put it in somewhere dark, in a dark cupboard. You could use a glass jar, but it needs to be in a dark place, okay? Away from light. Light can destroy herbs in a short time. Okay, oxygen the same way. We, we use um, specially designed vacuum sealed containers called TightVac. And I didn't bring any with me, but um, if you go online to TightVac, T-I-G-H-T, VAC, V-A-C, uh, if you want to properly store your herbs, you can get these containers and every time you shut the lid, it sucks the oxygen out of the container. And it's, uh, I don't work for this company, I have no, uh, it's called Tight Vac. Okay, and you can get all different sizes and, and colors and everything. But um, that's what we use to store our herbs in. And um, you can store them 300% longer if you have proper containers. Okay, so um, it doesn't mean that, you know, you'll get nothing out of it. What it means is it's going to deteriorate faster and so that means you may need a larger amount to get the same therapeutic benefit. But for the most part, teas or leaf, leafy uh, teas, okay, or such things like this, they'll last about uh, a year. About a year. Once you've, you've, you've uh, bought it, Actually, it depends on uh, where you buy it from. I never buy herbs from stores because stores never store containers, uh, herbs in the right containers. They put them in plastic containers and they could have been out there for months. They have no date on them. And, uh, but here's how you can tell if a herb is good or not. You look at the color. Uh, okay, you look at the color. If it looks washed out, doesn't look vibrant, then it's lost some of the phytochemistry because the color is indicative of the phytochemistry, okay? Also the smell. If it's lost its smell, and you've got to know what that smell smells like, all right, it should smell pretty strong, especially the aromatic ones. Um, you really should, you know, you shouldn't have to get your nose right on the herb to smell it, all right, um, because it's lost its potency, all right? And also taste. If it loses its taste, it's lost its potency as well. So as long as you can smell, see, or taste, you can tell if a herb is, is a sufficient therapeutic quality or not. All right? Question over so. is how much is the um, time that you can store them? Or? Yeah, that's what I was getting to. The leaf, about a year. Okay. okay. And then uh, roots. Um, be up to five years, okay? It doesn't mean the stroke of midnight in the fifth year, it all disappears, but that's just a general average. Um, some can last longer. It depends on how they're stored. It has a lot to do with that. If it's dried powdered root, probably three years is what they generally say. Berries can last up to five years if they're stored correctly. Um, but leaves are the most prone to deterioration because they've got a, you know, a, uh, a greater surface area for oxygen to penetrate and so um, they can get destroyed very quickly. So the ideal container should be only bottle, not plastic or... It's not, it's not the plastic is the problem. It's not like uh, I'm saying the gas from the plastic is going to destroy it or anything. It's the light that's going through the plastic. Yeah, so you'll get the same with a glass jar. But if you store it somewhere that's dark 
you know, then you can at least preserve that. So you don't have to have completely dark containers. I prefer to use them, but um, I'm dealing with herbs all the time, and my goal is to try to get the greatest potency. So I, I'm very much interested in that. All right, so if a herb doesn't work, it could be that the herb is not potent enough. It's lost its powerful properties. It's too old, right? It's been abused. It's been put in the light. It's been, um, it's taken six months uh, um, off the shelf life of the product. Um, okay, and then an another reason that herbs may not work is because you don't really understand the cause of your problem. If you understand the cause of your problem, see my wife, uh, getting back to using oat straw, she used several different herbs to sleep before she used this, but they all didn't work. You know why? Because it wasn't getting to the root of the problem. <laughs> okay, it wasn't meeting her physiological need. All right, so for example, how many causes are there of sleep disorders? There's over a hundred of them. Okay, it could be metabolic, it could be nutritional deficiency, it could be going for the fridge at, late at night, it could be mother-in-law issues, it could, <laughs> could be anything, right? Yeah. So many called vitamin D deficiency, um, stressed muscles, whatever, you name it. So if you know the specific cause of the problem, then you have more intelligent knowledge of what specific herbs are related to help you, okay? So if it's stress related, which is about half the problems that most people have insomnia, then you may use herbs that are helpful for stress, okay? They're going to decrease anxiety, they're going to help maybe neurotransmission, you know. Um, you could also get stress from um, endocrine problems, from hormonal imbalances, right? So you may need to address the hormones as well as the other issues going on. So you, this, this is why lifestyle is so important because I tell people that um, herbs work more effectively if you have a better lifestyle. Okay, because the last thing we want to do is educate people to use herbs like they do drugs. You just pop a pill if you get a headache and it goes away. No, you really need to un understand what the cause of that problem is. Now sometimes we may not understand the cause. Okay, we did not understand the cause of my wife's sleep problems. Okay, and that's where you can experiment and you can try maybe different groups of herbs. So you may try, for example, certain things that have a sedative effect muscle relaxant effect, neurotransmission effect, you know, try things for depression that relate to sleep. You know, you may want to experiment. It may take you a little while to get there, but it's worth the try. If we, if we had given up on, on that, where would we be today? And the people that get the best results are the ones that persevere. Okay, now, another thing, you may have to experiment with the dosage. You, you may not um, be getting enough, so you may want to up the dose. Um, also, you may want to look at what form you're getting it in. Okay, for example, most people take herbs in capsules, right? That's the worst way to take a herb. Now, I'm not saying that should never happen. I think there is a place for that, and I think the place is when they're bitter herbs, you can't get them down any other way. It's, you know, you, how can you take gentian root tea? Anyone had gentian root tea? <laughs> 50,000 bitter units. It's the most bitterest thing on the planet to take. Well, you, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose you as a friend for life if, if I tell you about gentian root and you take a tea out of it. And so that's good to take in a capsule. But it's sort of like canned food, you know. It's, it's the bottom of the ladder. Okay, so the, the, the way to get herbs in your body the most effective manner is either as a tea or an extract. Those are the two best ways. Right? Yes? The heat doesn't destroy it? 
No. Listen. Heat is the best way to get the properties out into the water so that you can digest them. Okay. Uh, let me explain something about heat. But you wouldn't put it on high heat properties, right? You usually fall low heat. Um, you, you don't need to put it on high heat, but some things do need to be on high heat initially to decoct them like roots. Sorry about my phone. It should be finished in any minute. There we go. Okay. Um, yes, listen. F cooking does not destroy minerals and it doesn't even destroy, and hold your breath so I can explain this, <laughs> it doesn't destroy vitamins. Okay, what it does, uh, let's say you're cooking broccoli. Okay, you cook broccoli and you think, ah, oh, I'm gonna lose my vitamin C from cooking that broccoli. Well, the vitamin C doesn't just go up in smoke, yeah. it, tr it actually goes into the water. So, you, you take that in the water, you're still getting your vitamin C. Okay. So water soluble means it, it dissolves, it's soluble in water. Okay, so as long as you've still got that, you still keep your vitamins. So nearly all herbs are better off cooking. Okay, here's why. You get a leaf, I don't have my leaf here, I'll have to get one of those leafy herbs. But you put a boiling hot infusion over a leaf. What happens is that heat it will cause swelling of the cells of that leaf and it will rupture, it will rupture, it will burst and then the contents in that cell are released and go in the water. So if you just try to chew on that leaf, you're not going to get anywhere near having hot water do that job for you. All right. In fact, ev everything you put in your stomach gets heated to a certain temperature before it can actually get into your bloodstream. Right? Um, yeah, anyway. There was a notion before that all rural food is the best food. Okay. I think that's the reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, why was a book written? Councils and Diets and Foods, it said, didn't say no cooking, it said poor cookery, poor cooking is the cause of much of our death today, you know, premature deaths, thousands of people. Okay, so it's, it's, that's why we're told that those who have the ability to have the, have the talent of cooking should consider they've been given ten talents of the Lord. So it's, no, here's, here's Okay, there is a truth about it, and there's, a, there's also a little counterfeit in there. And now, I'm not against raw foods. I think, I think they're great. But, there's limitations. Limitation. For example, uh, you know, who would like to eat a raw piece of rice or raw bean? <laughs> I don't think that would be very digest compatible. Okay, now, um, Okay, the theory is this. Theory is this. If you cook foods, you kill the enzymes. Okay? So you kill the food. It's dead food, therefore you'll be dead. <laughs> okay? <laughs> That's the bottom line. Well, listen. Um, if that was the case, we all would be dead, right? <laughs> um, listen, enzymes have to be broken down. They're made of proteins. Proteins are made of amino acids, right? So, enzymes cannot get in your body as enzymes. The intestinal villi will not allow enzymes through. They can allow undigested proteins through if you've got a leaky gut and things like that. They can cause autoimmune reaction. So they have to break them down. They break them down to the basic component which is an amino acid as long as you've got the amino acid pool, your body will reconstruct and it will put those proteins together and it will put those enzymes together. Okay, so it's not true that you need to have raw food to get enzymes. Your body will make what you need. Okay, I could eat cooked food all week and I'm still going to have saliva <laughs> on my next meal. 
I'm still making enzymes. All right. Um, Interesting because what's inspired writings, we kind of say, well, but then the other information that comes yeah, out, yeah, the yeah, yeah. we make it like so important. I know. It's just I know. Nice. I know. Balance is what we need. Common sense. Okay. So, um, you got you got a handout in there. You got a handout. Tips on to examine the quality herbs there. If you have a notebook, you have the handout. You have the handout in there. Okay. So, um, so I'm just I'm just going over briefly some of these things for you, but it's in your handout, okay? Because the 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 effect of the herb is largely determined by the quality of the herb. If the it's just like food. Okay. Yes, sir. You said that uh, it's capsule, right? Yes. Is that a good way to take? Uh, I'm saying it's not the best way. There are some. There is a place for it, but it's not generally the best way. Same with. Um, okay. Let Let me explain something. There is not a tea kettle in your stomach. Anyone here got a tea kettle in the stomach? No. So how does the how does the body extract the properties of the herb if it hasn't got a tea kettle in your stomach? No, but let's just say you take the herb. Let's say you take a powdered herb. How do you get those properties out of the powder? How does it do it? Stomach acid. Okay, stomach acid. Okay, is there stomach acid in your in your body all the time? No. Yes. No, it's not. 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 It's but you're not getting maximum benefit if you don't time the ingestion of the herb for hydrochloric secretion. Okay? Because we're not hungry all the time, are we? And we don't have acid all the time, at least in a sufficient amount for us to digest food properly. So if you take it at the wrong time, you're not, you're not going to get maximum absorption. Okay? So, um, Therefore, what you put in your body may not be, have an effect, at least in the way that you are taking it for. So, um, I don't recommend the, the, the powdered herbs to be taken that way unless they are timed the right way and they are used for a specific purpose that can't be taken in other form. So, I believe personally that the teas and the uh, extracts are the best way to get the herb into your body. Teas and extracts can be in your bloodstream in a matter of seconds. Wow. A matter of seconds because it doesn't rely on digestion. Okay? There are certain things that can go straight through the stomach lining without digestion. You put alcohol in the stomach, it goes straight through the stomach wall. Doesn't need digestion. Now, I, I'll just share with you another thing. I don't recommend alcohol for taking herbs. I don't. And if you are a bunch of herbalists, you'll be you'll be ready to stone me about now, because um, <laughs> you realize that I'm taking away a lot of your business. Um, and I'll just finish this, and then I'll I'll come to your question. Okay, I'll just finish what I'm saying. That alcohol. Is, it's used because it's got a long shelf life, five years, it's good at extracting, and it also is universally accepted. But alcohol also sterilizes, it denatures certain phytochemistry, it can also pull out certain phytochemistry or properties such as alkaloids that you don't want in there in sufficient abundance. Okay, not all alkaloids are bad, but most of them are toxic. And alcohol is often used to extract 
toxic alkaloids so I don't recommend it also has an astringent effect and it dries the tissue it dries it puckers it up and um, it also is very toxic and it uh, usually they use between 80 to 180 percent proof alcohol which one tablespoon of 180 percent proof alcohol would be enough to knock grandmother off a rocking chair so I, I don't recommend it's equivalent to one can of beer about one can of beer, one tablespoon of 180 percent alcohol. Most of the cup syrup so. has alcohol, isn't it? What's that? The cup syrup, they have alcohol. The capsules? The cough syrup. The cough syrup, yes, yes. You had a question? When is the best time to make powder dark? When's the best time? Uh, when you, you're just leading up to a meal, take it before a meal, you know, when, you, when you're hungry. That's the best time, and just with just with a little bit of water, not much. What just you get it down. Can we, can we have some quiet so we can all hear the question? Which herbs would you recommend for persons who have allergies and also like hypersensitivity to mold? Those kinds of issues. Okay. All right. Did you hear that back there? Yes. Okay. I know some of you didn't hear because I was struggling to hear. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. What herbs are good for allergies and also for those who are struggling with mold, right? Okay. Allergies. One of the best herbs for allergies. I'll bring it out later. It's called nettle. Net nettle, N-E-T-T-L-E. It's also urtica doacea. There's different types of nettle. It's a common nettle. Urtica doacea is its botanical name. Do you want me to spell that for you? Um, okay. Um, okay. And this is um, this this is found commonly. You probably have some out here in Yuchi Pines. Is that the same as sting? Yes, it's sting and nettle. So it's sting and nettle. And D O I. I. C I A. Sorry. Okay. Um, so nettle is um, it's got formic acid in there, just like ants have formic acid when they bite you. So that's what's stinging you. You put your hand in some stinging nettle and these prickly spines give you this formic acid. Well, here's the thing about it, and you could tell this to someone that's uh, all into raw foods. <laughs> if you cook it, you denature the formic acid, and guess what else you do? Is you turn it from a histamine reaction to an antihistamine reaction. Wow. Opposite. It's opposite. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So if you yeah, also you can dry it. You can dry it. Cooking. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I have a friend. Uh huh. He has a partial seizure. Epilepsy. Epilepsy. Yes. Yeah. The doctor called it partial seizure. Okay. Okay. Because he has it about when he was at forty-five something. Okay. You had your face with him. And they give him like Dylanthe, Capra, and Lamito. Did you say Cava? Yes. Okay. Capra. 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 Okay. Okay. P A P R. P R. Okay. No, P R E. Ah, okay. okay. Um, and also he put a part, a part that they call. Um, Gaba Plus, that's a natural vitamin. Okay. But it still has some, you know, episode, but it um, uh -huh. doesn't fall down, but you still have it. Now he asked me to ask if we can have anything here uh -huh. <laughs> that can help. Okay. With, that. With seizures, um, there are so many things that can cause a seizure. It's It's really hard to I'd have to ask him some questions, find out, you know, his history. Um, 
We don't have a lot of herbs that show very good promising with seizures. Uh, one of the most common herbs that is recommended is passion flower. Um, passion flower, P A S. Yeah, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, flower, because it's a sedative, it helps sedate the nerves. So that's something that um, has a calming effect. You know, if it were me, I would also try some oat straw. Oat straw, I would also try that as well, because one, it's good for nerve conduction, and two, it also has a relaxing effect, it has a calming effect. How do you study? Oat straw. Oat straw. The Vena sativa, which I mentioned before. Okay. Yeah, and the passion flower. And yeah, I would also ha have to do it, do a lifestyle evaluation and find out if there's anything in his diet that is causing any problems. Yes. Uh, I don't know where is the best time, but I would like to know something about herbs for cleansing. Cleansing, yes. And okay. uh, specifically, if possible, for parasites. Parasites, okay. I yeah, we can go over there. Sure. Okay. Yes. You said that the nettle, what, yes. what, what classification is it? The, 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 the pre-cooked nettle? Is it a histamine or a histamine? Oh, before it's cooked, it's a histamine. histamine. It, 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 that's what causes a reaction. You have allergies caused from putting your hand in nettle. Okay, another, another herb that you could use is butterbur. Butterbur. Now, even the medical profession, I was shocked about this, you go on WebMD and you look at herbs for allergies um, even they had something good to say about butterbur, they recommended it for allergies, for sinus allergies. So I use butterbur with nettle. The reason they did is because there's not much money in, in allergies. <laughs> yeah. Um, Do you have any of those nettle uh, we'll, we'll get some, oh here we go. Nettle leaf. Look at that, it just showed up. Uh, let me tell you about nettle. Yes. Nettle, ladies, you just, this is gold, this is green gold, now charcoal is black gold, this is green gold, okay, and, and this is one of the highest sources of nutrition on the planet, did you know that? As it is now, huh? as it is now. Yeah, I mean, you, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying eat it as it is, I'm just saying you cook it, but this is one of the highest sources, you got a vitamin A, Vitamin C, it has your B vitamins, also B12 is in nettle, even though it's small amounts. Yep, you got vitamin D, you've got vitamin E, vitamin K, vitamin P, you've got one of the highest amounts of iron in there. Uh, you've got, how do you cook it? How do you cook it? You could just look at a How do you cook it? It's the same way as that. It's the same way as, well no, you don't, you don't have to do a long steep, you can do a short steep. So five to five, six minutes, boil in hot water. Yeah, this doesn't need a long steep. It just needs a short steep. But this is, uh, this is one of the highest sources of iron, okay, and protein. Um, it's good for the eyes. It's good for the liver. It's also a hormonal regulator. It's good for digestion. It's good for the kidneys. It's good for the bloodstream, it's high in chlorophyll, it helps with detoxification. Uh, it's good for the skin, it's good for acne, it's good for the immune system. It, I mean, you name it, it's, it's if, if, uh, if God is raining manna one day and there's a little nettle around, I may substitute some manna with some nettle. Um, but um, oh it's God. it's amazing stuff. Someone had a question. Yes. The idea is you can get seeds and you can grow it in your garden. Oh yeah. And then you can eat it, and it's wonderful. It's yeah. Delicious. Yeah, you can. Well, in Romania, we have around yeah. and and we would we would cook it uh -huh. in, the, in the lifestyle center, and yeah. I tell you, it's so good, it's delicious. Yeah. Let, 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 listen. Let let me tell you something. Let me tell you something about nettle. Um, we've had ladies with anemia down to six. 
with blood transfusions. Okay? Come out of it because of nettle. Just take in nettle. Do we have seeds here? I have one doctor, um, actually, uh, a lady I was working with, she had problems with the iron. And uh, so I sent her some nettle extract. And it started to go up, and, she, and, the, and the doctor said, Oh, your, your, nettle, your um, iron's going up a little bit. And, uh, and she said, Oh, I'm on nettle. I'm taking a nettle extract. He said, he said, that's, that's, that's not, that's not going to help you. Um, so, what happened, she ran out of nettle, and then the iron started going down again. And so, she said, she told the doctor, and the doctor said, why don't you get some more nettle, and we'll do it, we'll do another test in a month later, and we'll see what what's happening. Huh? What was her eye problem? No, hemoglobin problem. It was down to six. Iron, yeah. It's down to six. So we sent a big bottle of nettle, and uh, she started taking it. And guess what? The globin started going up. They did another test a month later. The doctor still didn't believe it. Didn't, still didn't believe it. So how are we using this? We the eyes for that help. Yes. Yeah, in fact, um, there's another herb that's even better for the eyes. What is that? It's called eye bright. Yeah. Eye bright. Yeah, yeah. But if you want to improve vision, yes, you can use... This is very good because it's so high in vitamin A. It improves, improves the retina. So... How do you use this? Like, are we you could it you could just make a tea out of it. Again? Yeah, just like a tablespoon of nettle and one cup of water. You know, you you could take one two. I mean, you, it's hard to overdose on nettle. I'm not saying you can't, but you know, it's such a high nutritional herb that. It wouldn't matter if you took if you took two or three tablespoons. You did, you did so we can dry it out like the leaves. Yeah, you so just once dry it. Dry the leaves. Or can we black, Can we break it down into powder form? Yeah. There's no need to do. It. I wouldn't do it in powder. I would pour hot water over it because if you pour hot water with powder, um, it's hard to. Ex it, it's it. You're going to get all that. It doesn't separate very well, and you get this murky mud at the bottom. And so, so you're, you're better off. No, just make. No, no. All you have to do is just, like just do it like a cup of tea. So you boil your kettle, uh -huh. get some hot water, put one tablespoon of nettle in a cup, uh -huh. and then put the hot water over. Uh -huh. Let it sit five or six minutes, and then strain it and drink it. Okay. All, right. all right. That's all you have to do. It's do really simple. Do you have seeds? Yeah. Nettle seeds here? To grow? I don't know. Do they sell seeds here? <laughs> Valerie knows how to get, get them. You can get them out of seed catalog. Like yeah, you can get any seed catalog. Yeah. And there are some herb seed catalogs. Uh -huh. You can get all the different herb seeds that you want. Yeah. Is that so. good to buy herbs from the nettle store? So which... Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, t I, tell you, I tell you where the, one of the best places is to buy herbs from. Um, I, I buy my herbs from these people, okay, it's Mountain Rose Herbs. They, they have the high, Mountain Rose Herbs, let me write that on the board there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, once you start growing it, it'll grow every year for you. Yeah. Back. Yeah, listen, grow as many herbs as you can where you are. And I, I didn't mention this to you, but it's worth noting. Listen, herbs are like Jesus. Did you know that? Okay, let me explain. Okay. Usually, they're the last resort. Sorry. <laughs> last resort. Yeah, with the best results. <laughs> and the Bible says, God is not far off, He's nigh thee. Right? 
herbs are nayas, they're all around us. And it takes humility to get a herb, doesn't it? No. You have to bend down. And uh, they, the longer you take them, the better, the sweeter it grows. <laughs> they're always giving back always giving and they are universally accepted the, God puts the herbs near us where we need them the most okay so um, when you go in your backyard and you get your grass cutter think twice of what you're running over because you may have some serious herb, herbal properties in there that can help you. I mean, look, the herbs that grow in the most abundance often are, the, are because we need them the most. Okay? So, and listen to this. The herbs that are seen to be the greatest curse, like stinging nettle, often have the biggest blessing. See? That yeah. And 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 you remember what Isaiah called Jesus? A a herb, a root out of dry ground. Okay. Now is that a a happy environment for a plant, dry ground? No. It's pretty stressful, isn't it? If you're a root in dry ground, i got to tell you this, this is really amazing. This will blow you away. Do you know that plants have their own cell phones? Plants. They have their own cell phones. Yeah? And they know how to text message. So what they do, if a, okay, let's say you got a netted plant and a deer comes along, munch, munch. Then the plant sends out a SOS. Okay, sends out these chemical messengers, a little bit like pheromones. They travel in the air and they go to the plant next to them. And they say, watch out, you're next. Okay. And then the plant gets the message, uh-oh, trouble is lurking. And they put their energy into their defense system rather than into their nutrition. So what this means is that the plant that gets the most stress, it has the most potency of medicinal value. See, Christ became a curse for us to give us what? A blessing. All right? This is not a blessing right now. Okay, let me turn this off here. Oh, overseas call. Um, all right, it's my dad in England. Okay. Sorry, Dad. Uh, um, so, I haven't fi I just want to finish about this. Okay. So, if you get some herbs and you put them in a nice setting and pamper them and feed them all this organic stuff, guess what they're going to do with it? They're going to use it for their own selves. See, Christians that are, you could do a sermon on this. You just protect them. They, no stress, they got everything they need. Mm -mm. When trouble hits, they got nothing of value to offer. <laughs> you see? So, the one that goes through the most stress has the greater benefit to impart to you their immune system so that you can defend yourself. Right, wildcraft. Exactly. <coughs> Yeah. So, so do you drink that daily? You can. You can drink that. Yeah, you can drink that daily. So, get this. The herbs that are the most cursed in our mind are often the greatest blessing. Alright. So that's another parallel 
Jesus. Right? People turn away from the source of their blessing and end up with the thorns and thistles that hurt and destroy instead of the, the ones that bring the healing. Um, why don't we have a break? Is that all right? Yeah. Let's have a 15 minute break. And uh, when are we finished? This, uh, this isn't always the case, but this is just a general idea, okay? Um, so an extract is much more concentrated than a um, just having tea, all right? Which means if you're trying to say you're trying to sleep at night, um, you don't want to take two or three cups of tea before you go into bed because you're going to be up at night, so it's better to take an extract, you know. So, and plus, <clears throat> what I've found is most people are so lazy they don't make a tea. I mean, who's got time now to make a cup of tea? You have to go and get your tea kettle out, you have to fill it up with hot water, you have to plug it in, you have to turn it on, you have to wait two minutes for it to boil, then you have to go and get a cup out the cupboard, and then you've got to get a sieve, and then you've got to put the, get the jar of herb out the cupboard, you've got to put the tablespoon in, you've got to put it in there, you've got to put the hot water over there, then you've got to wait five or six minutes. Who's got time for that nowadays? I do. <laughs> Good on you. <laughs> More power to you. That's why, that's, why, that's why I'm able to make a living, because... People are too lazy to do the teas. Yes. I just make my four cups in the morning and then I mm -hmm. And I found this bottle helps really a lot to keep them nice Yeah. It's it's nice to make cups of tea. You know, if you get a nice glass tea I like glass tea kettles and they have a little slits in the bottom and it's sort of like therapeutic, just watching all those flavors just go into the into the water, it's really nice. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have noticed that a lot of persons are making the tea bags. Uh-huh. They're making the tea bags and they're saying yeah. that they're medicinal now. Mm -hmm. How they yes. make the tea? They make the tea bags yes. and they're saying that How good are the tea bags? Well, most tea bags, not all tea bags, but most tea bags have got chlorine in them. And uh, um, it, it is very toxic. Very toxic, even in small amounts it can cause cancer. Oh, is that email addresses? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just saying to someone, if, if you would give me your email address, I could send you some other information, okay. that type of thing, if you want. Um, that way I can keep in contact with you, and if you want to email me, you can. Did you get a um, serum website where all your products are available? Uh, I, I, I haven't, no. Um, do you want me to give it to you? <laughs> okay. It's uh, www.herballiving.org. Um, we, we mainly m make extracts. We do have herbal creams, we have oils, we, you know. So we make like oat straw, Vitex, uh, things for liver, digestion, hormones, brain function, energy, all that type of thing. And, and my email address is lee.hhp at gmail.com. And don't give this out to everyone, but I'll give you my phone number. Um, this isn't going on YouTube, is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, count that part. Um, yeah, just don't all contact me at the same time. <laughs> um, but uh, I tell you, there is a. I just, I just throw this in to the mix. There is a tremendous opportunity for herbal remedies mm -hmm. in the world now. Mm -hmm. Let me show you something. Okay, 80% of the world's population takes herbal remedies. Um. <coughs> <coughs> 
Is that a pretty big ministry? Yes. yes. Okay. Now in the United States it's not that big, but it's the it's the biggest component of alternative medicine in the United States. Herbal remedies. Okay. So tens of millions of Americans are using herbs. Seventy five percent of them don't tell their doctor. I wonder why. <laughs> Um, actually, I'm doing my thesis on the safety and effectiveness of herbal remedies in comparison with drug medication. And maybe during the program this week, I'll share with you some of my research. But um, it's, it's fascinating to me how diametrically opposed they are, um, and yet how much they're put down. Like Jesus, he's just trampled on the foot. Just like the herbs are like just totally vehemently degraded to like criminal. If um, yes. I just want to mention though, if, you, if people go to this class and they think, oh great, I'm just going to make salves and tinctures and stuff, and I'm going to sell them and talk, you have to be very careful because people are being arrested. Are you talking about that guy in, in the Amish community? Yeah, look, there is a way around that. There is a way around that, um, and I can tell you a way around that that's legal, perfectly legit, and you just need to know your jurisprudence. As long as you know your jurisprudence, you're going to be safe. It's only because people are, are going outside of that that they're running into trouble. Mm -hmm. So, um, you don't, you don't use certain words, you don't advertise certain ways, you have proper labeling, you can f form your own co-op, and you can sell in your co-op. And that's perfectly legal, you don't need anyone to come in to look in your kitchen, to have health department in there, if you form a, uh, like a co-op association, you can do that, perfectly legitimate. It's when you get on the internet, and I, I, have, I, have a, I know a couple of people where I used to live in North Carolina, they're her herbalists, and they had three visits from the FDA. Mm. And uh, anyway, you just don't step on the dragon's tail. <laughs> you've got to know the dragon, and you've got to know uh, where your safety zone is. As long as you keep within that safety zone, you're fine. So, I, d I don't prescribe herbs. There's no one in the country that is licensed to prescribe a herb. No doctor is allowed to prescribe a herb. No pharmacist, no botanist, no chemist, no naturopath, no anyone. It's illegal. Did you know that? To prescribe a herb? It's illegal in America. Yes. So if it's illegal. Yes. Listen, you, you, you need to understand what I mean by prescribing. And that doesn't mean advocating, that doesn't mean recommending, that doesn't mean educating. It means if you come to me and I say, I write it down on a letterhead with my business name and everything, one teaspoon of ginseng per day, two teaspoons, that's prescribing. So you can't do that. So, my work is to educate. Um, I leave it to the doctors to medicate. And so, I never. The Bible doesn't say my people perish for lack of medication. It's lack of education. So, um, listen. Herbs cannot talk. So I have to be their spokesman. So my job is to educate. So you know how you get around prescribing. You say, if it were me, this is what I would do, and there's, yeah, there's no problem whatsoever. And then you have a disclaimer written you on have anything a, they take out. Look, where I am in Michigan, I can't sell comfrey. Oh. You know why I can't sell comfrey? It's, only, it's in the state, it's not everywhere, it's not all the states. Because every state has to determine what's practicing medicine and what's safe practicing medicine. Uh, what's interesting is if you prescribe a herb, it's practicing medicine without license. But according to FDA, herbal remedies are not medicines. <laughs> so, Unless you say that here. <laughs> but uh, you can't prescribe, well, you can't even sell comfrey where I am 
because there were four cases of liver toxicity in the 1980s where people had adverse reactions supposedly to comfrey. Supposedly to comfrey. Now imagine if there was one drug that killed four people in 30 years. Would that drug be outlawed? No. It would be an excellent drug. <laughs> it would be, it would have trumpets blowing before yeah. it, right? Yes. Um, listen, aspirin, pretty safe drug, right? Mm -hmm. No. No? <laughs> it kills 15,000 people in the United States every year. 15,000. 15, okay. Now, imagine if a herb caused 15,000 people's deaths every year. What would happen to the herb? What if it caused two, if it caused two deaths? It would be on CNN. You'd see it tonight. CNN report. This herb caused two deaths. I don't think it was the combi that caused this liver toxicity. You don't? Well, I don't believe that either. I don't believe that either, but that's the report. There were four cases, two in the United States, one in New Zealand, and one in England, okay? In some of the reports, it seems that some were due to heavy drug medication, from what I've read. Also, um, you see, comfrey, the reason they, they don't recommend comfrey is because of the uh, toxic alkaloid um, that you've got in there. Uh, pyrrolizidine. It's a pyrrolizidine alkaloid is what it's called. Okay, now there are... T this is where you need to have... Um, s work with someone with experience because I don't recommend wild crafting. Not because it's... No, no, let me, let me finish. If you're not experienced. Okay. If you're experienced, you know what you're doing. It can be a blessing, but, but if you don't know what you're doing, you've got to be 110% sure right. that if you pick a, an elderberry plant, it's not a hemlock plant. Oh boy, that's for sure. Alright. be six foot under. Yeah. <laughs> and it may look the same. <laughs> so, and, and yeah, you just got to make sure that you really know what herbs you're looking at. Okay. That's the thing. So, when, when my son was two, from the age of two, my, my wife used to take him out in nature and they had a book and they identified the herbs. By the time he was five, he knew more herbs than we did. We couldn't teach him anymore about identifying herbs. He knew more than we did. I'd say, here, John, look at this dandelion. And he'd say, no, Daddy, it's not a dandelion. It looks like a dandelion. <laughs> he did, did tell me about it. I'm like, wow, that's pretty good, John. <laughs> Because just, you know, going through book after book, he, could, he finally ended up going through an encyclopedia. He, he could, you could show him a picture in the encyclopedia and he would know the herb. And uh, anyway, so you can teach children. You, get, you can get some of these uh, little books that color code and you really, they really specifically narrow down what that herb is. So there are books like that. Um, but make sure that you, you're not guessing. You don't want to guess with herbs, just like you don't want to guess what you put in your mouth, right? Um, as far as safety goes, herbs are the safest thing that you can put in your mouth. Did you know that? Out of anything you can put in your mouth, the safest thing, even safer than foods. Do you know there are 480,000 food poisonings every year in the United States? That would, that uh, 128,000 of those lead to hospitalizations. A lot of green leafy vegetables carry E. coli. And if they're not washed properly, and you know where that it comes from? It comes from the, ma the manure that spills off and covers the lattice leaf or the spinach. Spinach is high in problems if it's not washed properly. Um, so you really have to... You know how many people have reactions to herbs every year? How many people do you think die from herbs every year? 
In, in, in the United States, the last report we had, the last report from the Poison Control Center, zero deaths from herbal remedies. Okay. Um, the last report I have showed 21 serious reactions to herbs in the whole country. You know how many people have serious reactions to medications? Now, those reactions came as a result of overdose, like children grabbing a bottle of echinacea or, you know. So it's not like they're prescribed necessarily. It's poison control. It's like you've, you, you've just taken the whole bottle of something. And, you know, so even there you're looking at large amounts. You're not looking at so-called prescribed uh, safety, safe amounts. Um, four and a half million visits to the ER every year just from prescribed medication. Mm. It's the largest cause. Yeah. And a report came out just uh, a few years ago, actually two years ago, 2015 report came out showing there was about 26, 27,000 side effects from supplements in the United States every year. And that was based on extrapolation of getting a small population and you know how many hospital visits and then sort of spreading that over the whole United States. Well, even if it was 27,000 herbal reactions, which it wasn't, do you know where those reactions came from? They came from choking on the pill. <laughs> they came from caffeinated uh, agents, ca caffeinated herbal agents, herbal supplements, and they came from weight loss products which had caffeine in them. By the way, caffeine is very problematic with ER visits. ER visits, very problematic. And when you actually boiled it down, there were hardly any that were due to herbal remedies taken in their natural context. Yes, ma'am. I to find out um, how safe is the, the bush tea over the herbal tea? How safe is the what? The bush tea, like the sour soft, sour, sour soft tea. And the the tea. sour soft tea? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, I tell you, we, we were used to live in the Philippines. We had the sour soft so sweet that thing um, but yeah these yeah these are generally pretty safe it's the moringa that's different no 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 moringa is a we used to have the moringa a soursop is a fruit um, it's very sweet and it's yeah it, it's just it's so sweet and one mouthful is I don't know, it's sweet as honey. <laughs> it's sickly sweet. Isn't the sweet <laughs> sop though? Huh? I know there's a sweet sop and a sour sop. Yeah, sour sop. So the sweet sop, I think that one is sweet, while the sour sop is... What is sweet sop? Creamy. Not forgiving? Yeah, that's sour that's sour sour sour. yeah, that's what... No, no, no those... those, those <laughs> yeah, 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 yes, yeah. that's right, yes. We, uh, th those are fine. It's, it's, when I'm talking about bad teas, I'm talking about things like the green tea, okay? The chai tea. Green tea on average is between, yeah, 25 to 50 milligrams of caffeine per cup. Um, so it has, yeah, it, it has about half of that of a Starbucks coffee. Um, yes. Why do they recommend it for Parkinson's? Well, good question. Um, uh, with Parkinson's, you've got a problem with dopamine. Okay. Now, the best thing for uh, helping with dopamine, there's actually a natural, what we call L-dopa or levodopa. And the best place to find levodopa 
that I know of naturally is in uh, fava, sprouted fava beans. If you sprout the fava beans, you can increase it ten times the amount of aldoba. Um, so you can, you, you, you can get in 100 grams of fava beans enough what is prescribed in medicinal dosage if they're sprouted. All right, which isn't a lot of beans. Um, and so that's probably the best way to get that. I don't recommend tea for anything neurological, even though, yes, it's high in phytochemistry. It's high in what we call polyphenols, which is supposed to be good for the brain. But at the same time, it's got detrimental effects to it as well for the brain, like fluoride, aluminum, knocking out GABA. It makes you, I remember Dr. Baldwin said, it makes you think like a lizard, he would say. So what, what about the herbal um, teas? Would you recommend herbal teas? Oh, we're not talking about herbal teas. We're talking about... I know, I'm just saying. Okay, but not all herbs are safe. Okay, remember there's a, there's a text in the Bible that says, when God gives a blessing, He adds no sorrow to it. Right? So this is how you know if something's good for you or not. There's no n kickback. Alright, so um, when God makes the herb, He puts everything in there that's going to help you. He doesn't, he's not going to say, take this herb, it's going to help your nervous system, it may just give you a heart attack. But try that herb, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help you. No. So, but some, I'll get to you in a second, but some herbs have been genetically manipulated. You remember the parable of the sower and, and, and one night an uh, enemy came and sowed tears? That's what Satan, Satan's been doing genetic manipulation from day one. That's why we have some herbs that are toxic. God never made toxic herbs. Yes. You mentioned fluoride in some of those herbs. Yes. So that's in that's in the green tea. Okay. So Camellia Camellia sinensis. Could that mean we're not supposed to well fluoride toothpaste is toothpaste is not the best? Fluoride toothpaste. Okay. There's a difference. Our body does need fluoride, but not high amounts. Okay. Okay, there's organic and there's inorganic fluoride. Okay. In its natural context, fluoride at very small amounts can be helpful to a certain degree. Okay, it, it's, it's one of those micro uh, elements that the body uses. Okay, but um, I mean, the body also uses arsenic, you know, in small, small amount, like cyanide, should I say, not arsenic, cyanide. Um, but, um, the thing is, the tea has so high amounts, it can, it can run up to 300 parts per million. Okay, and that causes fluorosis of the bones. Yeah, so you get holes in the bones. Okay, there are 40,000 people in the United States that die every year from cancer due to fluoride alone. 40,000. It can be, and, but that's mostly inorganic fluoride. And that's not necessarily brushing with your teeth, uh, fluoride toothpaste. Yes? I'm not a person. Uh huh. It really piqued my interest with all of this. Right? What would be some of the guidelines for me? Or is there a book that would tell me, like, what okay. to do to stay away from? What herbs to stay away from? Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> There's so many books, you know, the problem is this with herb books. Nearly all the herb books are written by New Ages. New Age uh, philosophy. So they, they give you some good information about herbs, but then they mix it with mysticism. So I, I'm always reluctant to sort of, you know, I started writing a book, I haven't finished it yet. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, yeah, keep having to do seminars, that's my problem. <laughs> um, but uh, look, generally, the, 
okay, you've got to look at, I, I, I tell people stick with the most common herbs, okay, and yes, there are some herbs that are bad for you, okay, um, usually you find it by the side effects, okay, and some things we know from common sense, just the effect that people have. Uh, I don't need a thousand research papers to tell me that marijuana is is uh, is going to help people when I see the visual effects, right? <laughs> if I know it's going to make you think, you know, like a Fruit Loop, and you you can't pass a test, you can't walk straight, you don't know who your name is, and you know you're walking sideways. I don't have to ask, pick up a book and convince me that it's good for me. Yeah. All right. And back to Eden. Back to Eden, it's got a lot of good stuff in there, but it's not, it's not, I, I don't feel it's one of the best resources. No, I don't think. Um, it needs updating. It needs some serious updating. Um, okay, I tell you, we've got, for those who are really serious about herbs, we've got an online course at Light. So, um, if you can put up with me for a few hours, um, we take you through three main textbooks. Okay, so we go through uh, herbal textbooks, and then there's some of the most common textbooks like um, Green Pharmacy with James Duke, he's the world's leading authority on herbs. Phyllis Bauck, um, Prescription of Herbal Healing. Um, and then uh, there's another book, we use um, Psychopedia of Medicinal Plants. Um, anyway, we take you through those books and I just correct the books. Instead of writing the books again, I just throw in a video. Okay, this is what it says here. And, you know, I, I think this doesn't have any merit to it. And this is the reason why, you know. So. And we also, I'll just take you a question a minute, I didn't bring any here with me uh, right now, but we also have a DVD series, which goes through several hours of DVDs. Yeah. I go through like top 20 herbs, what they're good for, contraindications. I go through like dozens of different recipes where I show you, demonstrate in the kitchen, how to make it, how to do it at home, that type of thing. So, yes ma'am. My cousin is on tannins. Your question is on tannins. Yes. The green tea having tannins. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's a favorite author of mine that mentions tannins. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed as I go through herb books that mm -hmm. some herbs have tannin products. Yes. Yeah. Now, not all tannins are bad. I, okay, that's yeah. what I mean. Fruit has tannins in. Right. Some fruits have tannins in. Some vegetables do. Yeah. It's a bit like this mushroom controversy, you know. Mm -hmm. So mushrooms have chitin in it, which is like this exoskeleton is made up of the sea crustaceans, therefore we shouldn't have we shouldn't have mushrooms. But then chitin is also in fruit. So what do you do about that? You know? So you've got to be logical, okay? So, um, the thing is, just because of phytochemical, look, there are things that ident are identical chemically that have a different f uh, effect in the body. And let me give an example. Okay, in meat products you have arachidonic acid. And that causes inflammation. It causes a chemical cascade effect through prostaglandins, from vaccin A2, that type of thing. It causes just inflammation everywhere in the body, especially the joints for all the folks. Um, but if you take, let's say, omega-3s into your body, let's say you eat walnuts. Is walnuts good for you? Yes. Okay. Well, when, the, when it goes in the body, it gets broken down. You've got these 18 chain omega fatty acids. They get elongated with two extra carbons and it becomes arachidonic acid. Well, does it cause inflammation in the body? Yes. No, it has an anti-inflammatory effect. Mm -hmm. Same arachidonic acid is a 20 chain carbon, mm -hmm. but it's anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. How's that so? <laughs> I 
<laughs> I'll let the Lord figure that one out. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we got to be careful. We some things, some things you know just chemically what they do that you should avoid them in any form. But other things you have to sort of weigh it up and think. Well, maybe there's something we don't know about this. Maybe you know. Maybe if it's, it's something that we eat that's really good for you, maybe it's in a different, metabolized differently, maybe it's, um, it's taken care of. I mean, there's even caffeine in carob. Did you know that? No. Sorry. There's caffeine in carob, but it's so small, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's infant, it's, it's like, it's like one part per, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just, giving you a guesstimate here, so don't uh, hold me to this, but it's like one part per billion or something. It's a very, very small part, okay. So, um, we we got to be careful we not sort of get caught up if there's one atom of this and that, then we can't take it. Uh, at the same time, we've got to weigh it up. You know, is this something that God is blessed? Is this something that has a good effect in our body? So often we can tell how good a herb is by the effect. Has it been used traditionally uh, in the past and what's the, been the result of that? Does science also confirm that it has some benefit? 75% uh, of the clinical studies that have been done on the effects of traditional medicine and what they're good for have been validated. Okay, so if, the, if your great-grandmother used I don't know, cast oil for warts on your face or something. <laughs> There's 75% chance that she was right. You know? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> it's really interesting. You know, clinical studies, even the best clinical studies, have a 50% um, success rate. So, I mean, you can really toss a coin and it could fall either way. <laughs> That's the best, some of the best clinical double blind studies. It's crazy. So I didn't put too much confidence in double-blind studies even though I like to look at the research um, on that. Any questions? I wanted to know yes. what you recommend for arthritis. For arthritis? Yeah. Arthritis, um, okay. I take it, it it's, you know, it's rheumatoid or is it well, let me ask you, is it osteo, rheumatoid? Which one is it? Probably a combination. Okay. Well, look, any inflammation of the body, you need to automatically think of anti-inflammatories, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where herbs can really help. Mm -hmm. So, um, you remember when God took his people across the Red Sea? He gave them a promise. Remember Exodus 15? 26, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and do that which is right in his sight, keep all his commandments and his statutes, I will bring none of these diseases upon you which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee, right? Now it doesn't tell you what the diseases of the Egyptians were in that text or uh, the text after that, but it does tell you in Deuteronomy chapter 28. And if you read from verse 20 to verse 35, you'll get a whole list of diseases. If you translate some of those diseases uh, from the King James into modern English, then you'll find that uh, probably about half of them are inflammatory wow. in nature. Where, where did you say those, the list is? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 28 from about verse 20, 21 to about 35. Okay, and it mentions also afflicting in the joints. Okay. okay, inflammation of the joints, arthritis, okay. Um, God doesn't tell us something because he, he doesn't have to bring a curse upon us. He never brings a curse upon us. He was made a curse for us, it says. But he's, this is the natural result of doing this, is basically what he's saying, you know. And so... Um, all the, the, the diseases of the Egyptians that they had, they are the same diseases that we have today. And they're inflammatory diseases, they're arthritis, they're diabetes. Do you know that even, even depression is classed, get this, as an inflammatory condition? You haven't heard that one? Yep. 
as some of the latest research, depression is an inflammatory condition. Mm -hmm. How? Because depression leads to changes on a, on a, on a, on a especially in the endocrine system that causes an inflammation cascade. Okay. Um, stress, stress will do that. So, if you if you're walking down, let's say you're walking through the woods, and you see something black and slithery at the corner of your eye, what's going to happen? I'm going to run. You're at. What's going to happen to your heart? What's going to happen to your lungs? Start breathing shallow. Breathe shallow. No, you're going to. Expand. You're going to expand. What's going to happen to your pupils? You're going to get like this. Right? And your blood is going to be... Your brain's going to speed up. And then you just about to run and you see... Oh, it's a garden hose. Oh. And then... What happens then? Everything relaxes. <laughs> Back to normal. Okay. What made the difference? Was it perception? perception? See? Your perception of what causes you stress determines the physiological effect on your body. Look, I met a lady in Japan. When I was over in Japan, she was crippled from looking at a centipede. Oh, what? A centipede. Yeah. She was, she couldn't walk properly. It messed her up from looking at a centipede. Okay. She was scared, of terrified, absolutely terrified. Now, you have three phases of stress. Three phases of stress. The acute phase, fight or flight. Okay. Then you have the adaptive phase. You get used to it, you, you get accustomed to it. Then you have the fall off the cliff stage, <laughs> the exhaustive stage. That's the end result. <laughs> that's, when, that's when you collapse in a heap, right? So, um, most people who are in stress, it's not fight or flight. It's over here. It's at the end of the adaptive, it's at the beginning of, or the end of the exhaustive phase. That causes inflammation all over the body. Mm -hmm. See? So you're lying asleep at night and you hear someone on the other side of the wall. It's a burglar. Mm -hmm. You've got a sawn off shotgun and you're not an Adventist and you shoot and, <laughs> and bullets go everywhere and you hope that one of them hits okay but you've done a lot of damage in your wall everywhere so that's what happens in the body when you get stressed it causes damage that's inflammation it may hit your target, but it's also caused other damage. There was a there was a guy, um, there was a guy who was rock climbing one day, and he 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 was vertical on this on this ledge, and he uh, had this rock come off him in front. So the thing he's holding onto falls on top of him. The whole right. This was a thousand pound rock. Thousand pound rock falls straight on top of him. He's 20 foot off the ground. So he falls 20 feet with this rock falls straight on top of him. Now, you think he'd be instantly dead. He wasn't dead. Fight or flight kicked in. And if that wasn't a bad day, he's sliding down a, a ledge towards a precipice, okay, with this rock still balanced on his chest. So he's trying to support this rock and he's sliding back first, head first down this, this ledge towards his precipice and he's just going to go over the edge. 
and he gets right to the edge and he throws it over his head. Wow. And, it's, and he survives. Could you do that normally? No. <laughs> That's a fight, fight or flight. There have been mothers who've been able to lift up cars to save their children. You know, in a, fight, a serious fight flight response, you can use 100% of your muscles. Just lifting something heavy, doesn't matter how hard you try, you're only lifting maximum about 30% of muscle, mu muscle use. So you're not using every, every single muscle in your body. It's too exhausted. But in a fight flight response, you can do it. There was a man that ran 60 miles an hour when a house exploded. He was a police officer to get to his car. 60 miles an hour. What? Yeah, 60 miles an hour. Yeah. He ran 60 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he doesn't need a car. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to blow up a house to do it though. That's the thing. <laughs> Sometimes we need motivation. <laughs> you see? But that's what it's for. The energy is for that particular emergency. But you don't want that emergency to last for, for a long time. You want it to resolve. And then you can go back to normal. That's what it's designed for. You see? So, in that setting, if, you, if you're highly stressed, you're using up all these reserves. See, you're using up your energy reserves, your adrenal reserves, your hormonal reserves. Everything is getting drawn in to surviving. And then your body collapses later. It collapses. Often people are drawn on future reserves to pay for present debt, if you know what I mean. So, now, so herbs can help with that. You can use herbs to help with that. Okay. Okay. Herbs can help with adrenal support. So I would recommend uh, ashwagandha. Someone's always going to ask me, how do you spell that? So, so I, I will save you the effort. Ashwagandha root. And roll the ola root. Roll the ola root. Now these two, these two work on uh, work on adrenals and. Are these both fine during pregnancy or lactation? Um. As far as I'm aware, but let me double check on that. I haven't seen them as a contraindication, and I have a, a list of. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. There are there are there are things that you can use for pregnancy that can strengthen your adrenals without a problem. Um, but these are the only they're tr what we call adaptogenic herbs. They are true adaptogenic herbs. There's some herbs that are called adaptogenic that aren't really adaptogenic, but these are, and that that means they help you resist stress. Okay, that means they help modulate whether you're high or too low. So let's say your thyroid's too low, it can bring it up. If it's too high, it can bring it down, uh, and and. It works on strengthening your, your adrenal glands. It's a, it's a support to your adrenal glands. And um, another good one is ginseng. Um, but I would just like to add that there are three main types of ginseng that we have. American ginseng, then you have Chinese ginseng, uh, also known as Panax ginseng or, or red ginseng, Korean ginseng. It's all the same ginseng. And then you have Eleuthera root, which is Siberian ginseng. And so the, the ginseng that's very fast acting is the, is the Panax or the Chinese. And that's really, oh, that works super good. I remember I did a trip four days around the world with two young children. Yeah, I, I got kicked off of planes. I got redirect. I mean, I just, 
it, it was no fun. No fun. No fun with, with a one-year-old child and a five-year-old boy. Yes, it was no fun. I felt flat as a pancake. But I took ginseng, the Lord impressed me to take my own medicine. And within literally 10 minutes, I felt 20 years younger. I felt energy. I felt, felt totally normal. <laughs> Just with panic. Um, but you, you won't feel it as much unless you're really low. You know, so if, you, if you're doing okay, and you don't want to take ginseng long term unless it's Siberian. Because it's like high octane gasoline. You know, sometimes we're led to believe, well, all herbs take time and they're slow, they like the tortoise and the drugs, the hair. Well, not necessarily. Some are like the hair, and this is one of them. Ginseng is very fast acting, and it's not like caffeine. Um, it won't drop you in a hole at the end of the day. If you take it in the morning, it'll give you energy and it'll help you sleep late at night. It helps you sleep, but if you take it at night, it will keep you awake. So you take it in the morning and you don't take it for more than four to six weeks at a time. And um, then you have a month off. Most herbs, you, you just have a day off or you may want a week off, but ginseng, you want a month off between the point of starting it again. And it stops the de degradation of cortisol, which is a stress hormone. So that keeps that hormone in your bloodstream longer. And so that helps you resist stress. Okay. For, for, for if you've got a chronic fatigue, if you've got prolonged fatigue, now if it's if it's really, if you're if you're in a really really low state, you can take ginseng temporarily. But then what I would do is substitute that because you can't take it long term and start using Siberian ginseng or Eleuthera root. What's that? This is for adrenal glands. This is for prolonged stress. Prolonged stress. Now it can interfere with the lady's hormones. It could uh, mess up your time of ovulation. Um, it's estrogenic so just be aware of that and you don't want to take it if you've got any heart stabilizing medication that are helping with, you know, cardiac arrhythmia and things like that. So if you're um, taking leather wart and hot berry for your heart, then you get the To take it with Hawthorne berry? And leather wart. <sighs> okay. Uh, Hawthorne berry, no, okay, let me explain. Hawthorne berry, what that does, it helps increase the left myocardial contraction which increase greater cardiac output and so that stimulates and your left ventricle is what's the last chamber before it comes out through the aorta and all over the body so that it's like um, nitroglycerin in that effect okay but it also has calcium channel blockers it's a vasodilator it helps with nitric oxide production and it's also a diuretic so it can help lower blood pressure in multiple ways besides just increasing. Uh, you know, I was saying, though, you were saying if you were taking something for your heart, because if you're regularly using your heart, like mother wart and heart therapy. No, I'm talking about if you're on drug medication. Only if you're, only if if you're on drug medic, yeah, if you're on drug medication, you don't want to take this one with certain types of drug medication that are involved in stabilizing the rhythm of the heart, okay? Uh, and most people use gin ginseng is one of the most popular herbs. Um, in fact, in, in Germany, it's probably one of the number one used herbs. Um, in China, it's called the king of herbs, ginseng. And it's very expensive. It's like a hundred. It cost me 128 dollars a pound just to buy ginseng. It can go up to 800 dollars a pound to buy um, ginseng. So, and you can. They can only sell so much ginseng. It's very. Um, it's a. It, it's something that is actually uh, under watch. Has been 
one of those that could be extinct if we're not careful. So they can only sell so much of it. It takes four years to mature a ginseng plant. All right, so when you grow ginseng, you, you can't just pick it the next year. You have to wait through about four years of age before you can harvest the ginseng. And it's the root that we're using, the root. And Why couldn't you use it more than six weeks? Why can't you take it? Yeah. Because it's like high thing gasoline. It's like revving up. It's, it, you just don't want it to be in that state of intensity too long. Yeah, so that's why. Um, some people use it for um, helping endure, going through, like, I, I had a 60-year-old guy from Asheville. He was taking it. He went into a marathon race, and he won it. And he rang me back and he said, I think the ginseng helped me to win the race. <laughs> I, I said, well, I don't know about that. But <laughs> it's interesting when you get stories. I've uh, had a few stories from people that have done things they've never done and, uh, through ginseng. <laughs> but uh, it's a powerful herb. It's a really powerful herb. But it's expensive and you don't want to take too much of it. In fact, uh, out of the, the times I've been involved in herbal remedies and giving herbal remedies and having people use the extracts, I've only ever had two reactions I can think of. Uh, people had a side effect and one was ginseng and that was because they took too much and they were on the recommended allowance and they were doing great and they thought a little was good therefore lots better so they ended up increasing it and then her heart started going fast and uh, she called me up I said look come off it completely for a week before you start using it again at a lower dose so that's what she did but caffeine will do the same thing in that sense of increasing heart rhythm but if you use it moderately, it will work for you. And it won't have a caffeine effect in throwing you off a cliff at the end of the day, which is a great thing about ginseng. Okay, um, oh, we're going to have a break, and then I want to make some elderberry syrup for you, okay? For me? Um, okay, well, I, uh, I said I was going to um, make something today, so um, you, you just have too many questions, you slow me down, so, all right. Well, we're going to make elderberry syrup. Do you, do you have your handout? Okay. Let's see here. Uh, oh, elderberry syrup. Okay, you see that on the recipes? Okay, it says my formula. You see that? Half a cup of elderberry, two cups of water, quarter of a cup of echinacea root. Now, I look for echinacea. We didn't have echinacea here. Uh, we had the powder, but that's just not going to work with a syrup. So, I'm going to have to make this without the echinacea, unfortunately. Uh, two tablespoons... I'm sorry? Yeah, I don't think... Uh, yeah, we didn't even have leaf either. I don't, didn't see any, so... Uh, sorry? So, um... We're just going to make a quick call. We might yeah, I, if you have, that would be great. Um, if not, we can still do it. But, um, we're going to put two cups of water in there first. Will it be as potent without the echinacea or no? Well, the reason I use the echinacea is for the immune system. Oh, okay. So, it, it is important to use the echinacea. Um, so, anyway, while she's doing that, how much elderberry? Half a cup. Half a cup. Okay, so, we will...
Okay, that's about half a cup. All right. And then we're going to put that on up to high. And uh, we've got two tablespoons of ginger. All right. Now, the reason we use ginger is because ginger is a diaphoretic and it will make you sweat. So often when we get colds and flus, we've got congestion, right? So that means the blood is is more in the thoracic cavity than it is in the external in the um, extremities, and so that weakens the immune system. Perfect health depends on what? Perfect circulation. Perfect circulation, that's right. So ginger helps circulation. It's the top selling herb in the planet today is ginger. Did you know that? There's a reason why. So everyone should benefit from ginger. Did you know uh, Because it promotes the search Alan White used ginger. Did you know that? She used ginger. And in cold climates like Michigan, where I'm from, <laughs> you want to you wanna use ginger. <laughs> All right. So what you do, um, have we got the echinacea? This is the root. Oh, you got the root? Yeah. Where was that hiding? Okay. Thank you. On the shelf. <laughs> Thank you. I did not see that there. Okay. All right. So we've got a quarter cup there. Um, okay, let's. So the echinacea we're using is the Augustifolia. You can use this one or the uh, Purpurea, um, Echinacea Purpurea. Um, there's another one, Echinacea pallida, which doesn't have any therapeutic properties to it. So I wouldn't use that one. So the root has more concentration of uh, the um, immune enhancing properties. So that's why we use the root. So all we have to do is bring this to a boil and then we're going to turn it down and let it simmer for about 20 minutes. So by the time we've let it simmer for 20 minutes, then we're going to be left with about a cup of um, elderberry juice from this. Okay. And then we're going to strain it and then uh, we're going to add our honey. Okay. So this is going to be a syrup. So um, it's hard to get little ones to, to take herbs unless they taste good, right? You want it to taste yummy. It just hits that tongue and you go well, zippy on those, t those, those little taste buds. So this will do that. Elderberry is nice, but it's a bit tart. You have to sweeten it up a bit. So that's what we're going to do. And um, so the elderberry will help with the viruses has a chemical in there called antivirin. Okay, antivirin. Think of antivirus, okay? And uh, what elderberry does is it knocks out the adhesive enzyme that causes the virus to attach the phospholipid membrane so it can't stick on the cell wall and inject its matter, its little needles <laughs> through the uh, through the membrane wall. Mm. You know, Jesus said uh, that uh, we have to go in through the door. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And viruses don't go through in, in through the doors. They find another way. They're a thief and a robber. Mm. You know, the cell doors, they have these pro called integral proteins, mm -hmm. and they open and close, and they allow particles in there. And the doors of the cell are so incredible. They have these little chemical sensors. They can detect to the smallest molecule anything coming in and out of the cell. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And so, um, if you take elderberry, has been used in pandemics where nothing else will work. Even the medical profession are in favor of elderberry. But they'll say, take Tamiflu first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If all else works, it fails. If that fails, take elderberry. Okay. All right, so it's almost near to a boil. And hopefully we'll give you a communion size taste of this end product here. Um, we're going to have to use a fair amount of honey. Now if you want to preserve this, you're going to have to use a lot of honey. And I'm talking two, two thirds of the actual ingredients when you're finished has to be honey. And that is in order to preserve it. Okay, it's, it's come to a boil, so we're just going to put it on low now. Because um, if, you, if you don't add adequate amount of honey, and by the way, honey has different amounts of moisture content, and so some moisture content is so uh, low that you end up um, uh, having problems. You, you can't get sufficient um, resistance to bacterial growth. So that's why when you go to the store and get that um, Sambuco, mm -hmm. it's 70% white sugar. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. 70%, yeah. Ah, that's that's to inhibit bacterial growth as well as sweeten it for the kids. Mm -hmm. So you don't carry this on your site because you would... No, no, no. I don't. I, I stopped making it. See, honey. What about maple? Honey doesn't. Uh, no. Uh, I don't. I don't recommend agave. No. Agave is uh, is mostly. It's a, on average eighty percent high fructose. Yeah. See, it it is not bound. To, like in fruit, fruit has fructose, it's bound to ethanol and it takes it out of the system without absorption. <coughs> Whereas in its free state, um, like agave, which is highly refined, it's in a free form and it sabotages liver function, can cause hyperlipidemia, can cause vascular issues. And the, the liver can only metabolize about 25 grams of fructose a day before it runs into problems. So. Um, yeah, I don't recommend agave. Could maple work? You could, you can use any other sweetener if you want, but for preserving... Right. See, here's the thing about honey. Honey does not, it does not spoil, but it does ferment. So you can end up with elderberry wine. Oh. Yeah. And you could be a little, little more merrier than you anticipated. So, um... For that reason, I didn't want to make this stuff <laughs> And you have to put some preservative? Well, honey is a preservative, but you have to use sufficient amounts. But even then, it could go off. It depends on the moisture content of the honey. So, um, you can put it in the refrigerator, freezing it. It's got its own problems with freezing and then dethorine. Um, but the best thing to do is just make it on the spot. It, it doesn't take long to make. I mean, that's right. You're putting the honey in for the taste. So couldn't you process it and have it ready for people, and they just take a portion and mix it with their own sweetener at home? But well, she, he needs a preservative if he's going to do something. Oh, like well, it will go bad. Yeah, I, I, no. See, I, I make it into extracts. But it's a different process. Oh, okay. So I use glycerin instead of honey, and oh, it's it's a whole yeah. Well, it's it's not it's not the same as a, you know syrup. See, glycerin is not a sugar, mm -hmm. even though it's sweet. Mm -hmm. Some things are very sweet with no sugar. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How's that? Stevia. 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 Yes, yeah, licorice is another one. Certain things that are chemically they fool you into thinking it's sweet, but it's not really sweet. Um, it doesn't. Honey has it in itself. Raw honey has medicinal. 
It does, that's right. And that's another benefit for using it because, you know, often when you get colds, you get a sore throat. It has its own antiseptic properties in there. It's, it's, it's antibacterial. Uh, it's very healing. Uh, the best honey is Manuka honey. Manuka honey, because it's got methyl glycol in there, which is a very high in enzyme activity. And um, it's used for wound healing. It's used for, you know, if you've got bed sores, um, things that, uh, like burns. Manuka is one of the best honey. It's very expensive. Very expensive. You pay $35, $45 a pound. But it's um, a pound. Uh, just one pound. But it's it is um, very. It's a superior honey. Yeah. So when does so. it ferment? When will honey ferment? Not when it's just by itself. It's when you mixed it with something. Oh, when you it, let's say let's say I put in there a few tablespoons of honey, yeah. and I sit it in a, a jar for a, say a couple of months. It'll ferment. The it, it, can, it can it can ferment, yeah. But it never ferments in that state where it you know the regular honey. Oh yes. Um, can it ferment too. Your honey yes, honey. No, honey ferments. Honey ferments if you put water with it. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. It's the water that's causing the problem. Gotcha. Yeah. I was thinking. Just, but you need the you need the water now. Some people. <laughs> have been able to use the honey alone without water but to me it's just too much it's just too sweet and so I wouldn't recommend that um, but you can do it but it's a it's a different process so I'm just trying to keep it keep it simple for you but um, when you do this um, you know it's uh, it's it's going to if you're making it with with a little bit of honey I would um, use it within a week and uh, if it were me I would take a taste tablespoon three times a day <laughs> if it were me I don't know about you but if it were me that's what I would do <laughs> Do not prescribe <laughs> Yes. So um, that will leave us with a, a cup of uh, juice. So we'll have the echinacea in there, the ginger in there, and, the, and, and then the elderberry and the honey. Um, Are you storing that on the counter or in the refrigerator after you make it with the honey and all? You, you, could, you put it in the refrigerator. One week. Yeah. It depends on how much honey you put in there. Um, there. There's another technique that you can do if it's not too complicated. You can put part honey and part glycerin. And then if you get, if you get the right ratio where you've got two-thirds preserver with one-third juice, you can preserve it. And you could preserve it up to a year. But if you put it in the bottle, and six weeks later, you you undo it and it goes. Psst. <laughs> then uh, I would, be yeah, <laughs> throw it away. It'll be merry. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yep. So um, now, Echinacea purpurea or Augustifolia in this case, it is helpful for stimulating more killer T cells. It increases the number and the efficiency of the killer T cell. The echinacea. Oh, is that? Did I point to the ginger? I'm sorry. Echinacea. There we go. There we go. But the, the the ginger works excellent with the echinacea because um, it's stimulating greater circulation which also stimulates the immune system so you get a double whammy and then you've got the elderberry that is antiviral and that's doing another effect in the cellular level so, so you could add ginger to that if you want. oh we we added oh, we added ginger already mm -hmm. to this yeah. so all we're waiting for now is is the honey so we're gonna um, 
let that sit for just a five minutes longer. We'll add some honey and then we'll, well actually we'll strain it first, add the honey and then we'll give you a little taste test. Okay. Anyone got a cold or coming down with something? Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah? just getting over one, so I'll, I'll take the whole bottle. Okay, I'll take the whole bottle. Okay, you, you have the leftovers. The uh, yes. pastor that was speaking this morning said that he was. Oh, the pastor? He was just a few days. Pastor Phil. He's been sick in years, but he said just a few yeah, days yeah. before he came. Okay. He was struggling, so maybe yeah. Well, this is really good for that. Um, our, our children, we just like the first thing in the morning, they get elderberry. Especially this time of the year. Yeah. Anytime there's a change in temperature, whether it's cold to hot or hot to cold, you're more susceptible for viral infections. Yes. How young can you give a child? How young? Well, the only. The main contraindication with really young, like infants, younger than, say, 18 months old would be the honey. Okay, now if it's a baby, let's say your baby's coming down with something and you're nursing, then if it were me nursing, <laughs> I, I would drink it. I would drink it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that baby will get my antibodies. So this is what you give your children during this time? Yeah. yeah. Look, it's it's hard to get the baby to take these sorts of things. <laughs> That's <a p> about. <laughs> I don't have a herb for that one. <laughs> now, there's some things you can do where you can get a dropper, and you can you can put it on your breast, and then while they're taking the milk, they get it that way. Because, but you know, the babies only need a small amount. I mean, you're thinking they're only, let's say they're 10 pounds weight. Um, regular dosage based on 150 pound man, so you got 15 times less than that. So that would be equivalent to one fifth of a teaspoon. Okay. Um, but if they're really young, just drink it as a mother, is what I would do. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, any other questions on this? You want to taste it now. I've got you all salivating, haven't I? Okay. So, hey, where's my assistant? Um, would you be able to do the honors? Thanks, Lydia. Um, if you could strain this for me and um, let's see. If you want to use that, you can, or a saucepan. What do you want to use to strain into? You want to use this? You could probably use that and pour it in. Oh, sorry. I thought you were grabbing the handle. Um, okay. I don't know if that's clean or not. If you want to rinse it out and just use that. Yeah, yeah okay. Alright, so, um, that's real, real simple. It doesn't take long to do. So, um, the, the honey is going to be according to, to taste. So if you're not going to preserve it, then you, you could use one tablespoon, you could use a, you could use a half a cup if you want, it's no problem. Yeah. Use a whole cup if you want. Sweet, sweet tooth. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, any questions on that? Shall I? What shall I move on? Preservatives do we use aside from honey, glycine, and alcohol? Is that the only three preservatives that we use? Only three preservatives. Okay. Um, that's the main preservatives, yeah. Um, usually it's glycerin or alcohol. Water does not preserve. It destroys. So we That's right. Tincture we put alcohol. Yeah, tincture is used with alcohol. Yeah. Now I'll just tell you about alcohol. Some people think you just boil it and it destroys the alcohol. It takes two and a half hours to destroy alcohol by cooking. Two and a half hours of cooking to destroy alcohol. Okay? You know, my, when I was younger, my, my grandmother used to make a Christmas cake and she'd put this rum 
over the top and she would light it and we would think the alcohol would be burnt up well it's really only the the alcohol gives off a vapor right. and it's the vapor that burns up but the alcohol is still there so um, it, it takes a while to get rid of alcohol yeah, now it depends on the amount of alcohol, it depends on the percentage of alcohol, it depends on the heat that you're applying. Okay, so I'm just, I'm just giving you a general rule, you know, if you were to get an extract, for example, that is alcohol based, it's not gonna, you're not gonna be able to pour hot water over it and get rid of the alcohol. Because some people think you just pour hot water and you just get rid of the alcohol. Or you just cook it for five minutes, you get rid of the alcohol. It doesn't, doesn't work that way. Oh, okay. Um, everyone have sweet tooth? Okay. Okay. All right. Well, let's put half a cup of honey. Half a cup of honey in it. All right. So we're going to use half a cup of honey and I think, uh, okay, the, the recipe here, the recipe that says two cups of honey, that's for, that's for preserving, okay? That's not, that's not just for taking, you know, uh, to, to, to make this, to take it straight away. That's like for storing it for several months, all right? So, uh, we've got a little communion cups there. Now, if you, if you make it into an extract, then actually I'm going to be sharing with you probably tomorrow because we're going to run out of time, but I'll share with you how you can make a herbal extract. Just with a real simple uh, cooker, one of those slow cookers, just using a jar and a slow cooker, some vegetable glycerin, you can make your own extracts. Wow. It's really simple. Um, just need to know a few little details, but once you got those down, you'll be cruising. <laughs> Where do you find these double boilers in a glass like this? Is, um, this one? is this yours? No, this is my... I didn't bring anything with me equipment-wise or anything. I, I didn't bring herbs with me. I was limited to what I could bring. <laughs> I so I... I talked to Lydia, she said we have the herbs here, we have the cooking equipment here, so so I just yes. Oh it belongs to you? That's that's yours, huh? Oh, okay. I I got you can get them from eBay. eBay somewhere but really yeah. because when I bought mine for around twenty five dollars, yeah. I don't know what happened, but I went back in the chest and the price jumped Yeah. Listen, with about, with about a, uh, if I can have everyone's attention, with about a hundred to two hundred dollars of equipment, you can start a herbal business. About a hundred to two hundred dollars of herbal, of kitchen equipment, you can start a herbal business. I started... I started with these, I started with a crock pot and not much else. <laughs> and I started teaching and that's how I started. Yeah. So you just use what you have. God says use what's in your hand. Right? And uh, he'll multiply it. And as and you learn a little and teach a little, then you learn more. You learn more. That's right. You don't know what you know until you start teaching it. <laughs> yeah. All right. So now this shouldn't interfere with your um, supper, and um, hopefully we'll have. How many ounces did that get out of that? It is one and a half cups. One and a half cups. So twelve ounces. Let's give everyone half an ounce. 
So that would be a sip each. <laughs> what, what part of, of the, 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 the berries? Uh, flowers or? Which part of what? Elderberry. Elderberry? Okay, it's just the berry. It's the berry, so. Berry the, the fruit. It's the fruit. The black oh. berries. Like, it's like uh, bilberry, um, blueberries. Just small. In my, in, in my country said that this is poison. What? Elderberry? Yeah, just, just the flower is good, not the seeds. You, you're saying that that's the seeds? The fruit? The fruit. The fruit. The fruit, the fruit. yeah. Yeah. It's a fruit. It's not, it's not the, uh, you know, the, the seed. Well, okay. It, it can be... It can have a toxic property if you take it raw. But if you cook it, that's the cyanide. If you cook it, it takes care of cyanide. Yes. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yes, you cook it. And it's not toxic. Yeah. How, how's it taste? It's good. Very good. Yeah. It's very sweet. Too sweet? Didn't need the honey? You like the ginger? Okay. They said they wanted it sweet, so I said for the children. But you could you could take it as it is, but it's quite tough. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know that's the problem. <laughs> I'm getting sick. Give me this. <laughs> You only bring it to a boil. Once it's brought to a boil, then you turn it down and simmer it. So, as soon as it's... Sorry, could I have a... Could, could, could you keep it down? Um, as soon as you bring it to a boil, as soon as it starts bubbling, then you, then you turn it down. Straight away. As soon as it starts bubbling, then you turn it down. Yeah. To low, that's what I did. Wow. Okay. Blueberry is in the same family as the, sorry, uh, elderberry is the same family as bilberry, blueberry. It's high in anthocyanidins. It's got high amounts of phytochemistry. It's very good for the brain. It's good for upper respiratory tract infection. It's good for digestion. Um, there's so many things blueberry is good for. Good for you. your eyes, your capillaries. It helps strengthen capillary membranes. Just ginger root. It's just regular ginger root. It was dried. It was dried. Yeah. Now you can do it fresh. You can take it fresh. Was the ginger too strong? No. It was just good? Okay. It, 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 yeah, it should, the honey should mask it a little bit, but it should give a little kick. It's got to have a kick to it. It can be, but... This is, these um, are the fruits dried. Yes, that's the dried fruit. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we just need the bread now, don't we? It's just like communion, so size. size. Mm. Yeah. It tastes real good. It's just sweet. Yeah. I think the berry yeah, it's good. had like some it. sweet something in it. It was sweet as well, right? You could smell it when it was cooking. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's got a nice smell to it. You can put less uh, sweetener. <laughs> you can put, yeah, you adjust the sweetener according to taste. Yes. Um, some people, they say the ginger is not good uh, because it irritates, I'm not telling you, but it irritates the uh, digestive system the same way as cayenne pepper or whatever. Mm -hmm. Could you please help me to understand how it uh, works? Okay. Um, okay. The, yes. No, let, me, let me explain something. Not all spices are bad for you, and not all stimulants are bad for you, okay? Um, 
for example, olive is a stimulant. Licorice can be a stimulant. Ginseng is a stimulant. Okay. Um, now, it does not irritate. Uh, unless you have a stomach sensitivity. Some people have a sensitivity. So some people have a reaction with taking strawberries. So you just use common sense. But it, no, it works very well for digestion. It's one of the best things for digestion. It's used for nausea. It can help settle the stomach. Um, it's anti-inflammatory. It does not um, irritate the gastric mucosa. So it is good. In fact, Ellen White took ginger. Um, it seems, it, it's, in my opinion, it's on par with garlic. Garlic's a stimulant too. Now, things that irritate the stomach um, mucosa are things like pepper, like black pepper, white pepper. Um, uh, there is, um, uh, what's it called now? Uh, nutmeg, you know, mace, uh, sometimes cinnamon can be a problem. Um, cayenne. Okay, I'll tell you what, <laughs> cayenne is one of my favorite subjects. Cayenne? Cayenne, yeah, okay. Can you pick up that one? Can I save that one? Yeah. Okay. I will come back to that one. It's basically, it's, it's really, really good for many kinds of ailments. Yeah. Cayenne. You read, uh, now you got me going. Okay. <laughs> Cayenne should be in everyone's yeah. first aid kit. Yep. Yes. Okay. Yes. Listen. We have cayenne. Do you sell the liquid cayenne? We, we do. We have the cayenne pepper. And um, if you, you can abort a heart attack, you can abort a stroke, you can abort um, hemorrhaging, internal hemorrhaging with a few drops of cayenne extract. Yes, it is hot. And yes, um, it's a medicine. No, I'm not saying we should use it every day. Um, does it irritate the stomach? Well, okay, this is my, this is my opinion, my opinion, okay? Um, some people say it irritates the stomach lining. Now, I haven't read any information on that. I don't know, I don't see any inspiration to recommend or to suggest that. I know there's some authors that say that. Um, but I don't have the evidence for it. We don't have the science for it. Um, now, it does increase the blood flow to the stomach. Okay. It's, it's possible if you had large amounts, it could be irritating. Um, it is a, definitely a stimulant. But as I said, not all stimulants are bad. It will increase the circulation system like nothing else will. Okay. Um, but listen, if someone's having a heart attack, you're not going to have a debate with them whether it's going to irritate the stomach or not. Okay. So this is what I this is what I would suggest. If you take cayenne pepper as a medicine, take it. Um, at the back of the tongue, they don't have the heat receptors there, so it, 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 it's not going to make you feel like you've just swallowed a fire. Okay. So, but if someone's having a heart attack, you shove it in no matter how you, how you can get it in, they'll thank you for it later. Okay? <laughs> so, just uh, if someone's having a heart attack, I would use a, a, a drop of two, f f yeah, two or three dropper fools even because um, that can save life. Paramedics use cayenne now. There was a man who lost his limb and um, his friend knew about cayenne and doused it with cayenne pepper and the paramedics came in and just gave him a real hard time, chastised him, took the friend away, um, called the, the friend back who helped with the cayenne and said, uh, we just want to apologize, you probably saved his life. You know, because it cauterizes blood vessels. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing. I just check out once I yeah. <laughs> said this. 
But if the blood vessels are healthy, it will leave them alone. If they're damaged, it will cauterize them. Yeah. So, cauterize them, it burns them so that you don't hemorrhage to death. Many times that's going to be delivering the baby and the mother hemorrhages. Yeah. So some people think, well, because it burns, it has a burning taste, then it's going to burn a hole in your stomach. It doesn't work that way. And it doesn't burn when you apply it externally. Yes, it doesn't burn. Let me tell you a story. I'll get to you in one sec. I was on a trip, I was flying from Chicago over to Narita Airport, Japan. It was a 13-hour flight, so my feet were getting cold, I had two, two hours to go, so I thought I'm just going to get some cayenne salve and just rub it on my feet. So I got this salve and I put some on my feet and 15 minutes went by. I didn't feel anything, so I thought maybe I didn't put enough on. So I just got some more and I put some more on and uh, 15 minutes later, I didn't feel anything. I thought maybe this is an old salve. So I got, I really lavished everything this time. And I got my whole feet and didn't feel anything till I got off the plane. Oh, no. And I started walking through the airport and I thought, why are my feet are getting warm? <laughs> Boy, they are really warm. <laughs> They're hot. <laughs> They're burning hot. <laughs> And so I was putting my feet up there on the <laughs> on the water fountain, <laughs> down. <So laughs> was it because you were anyway, I realized later, I found out later that that, that sweat activates uh -huh. the heat properties in the cayenne. So don't do what I did learn from my mistake. I had blisters on my feet the next day. Um, yeah, don't put this in the eyes, in the no, you know. Just use it <laughs> with intelligence and you'll be fine. <laughs> yes. Yes, ma'am. Um, the next crack in the you can find that without the alcohol. Sorry? Is there a name, a brand that has the... Is there a brand? That has the cayenne extract without the alcohol. Yeah, this one does, right here. Yes, this is one of the rare cayenne that you can get with just it's uh, and this I actually don't I've got another company I'm outsourcing to with um, herbal products and they have technology that I don't have so they're able to concentrate four times more than standard extracts so you don't need very much um, at all so and they use glycerin yeah so I try to find the best company I could use so um, it's really good. You only you only need a very small amount. I use um, cedar bear. Cedar bear. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So if a cayenne can stop the bleeding like that, on like on a cut and it cut cauterizes, then how is it working in a stroke or a heart attack when it's opening things up so that? Okay. Amazing. You're rupturing blood vessels, right? With a stroke. You've got leaky blood vessels. So that's what it does. It helps. So when that ruptures, so you get an aneurysm, you rupture, the cells, have got to, you, you've got to work fast to patch that up. So that's what it, that's what it does. It helps, it helps uh, basically, it, it helps those cells to just it stick and hit here and just patch that that break up very quickly. Sorry, in leaky gut, guys? Leaky gut? Leaky gut is different. What about it? Leaky gut effect? is different. When there's blockage in the bloodstream. Okay, when there's blockage in the bloodstream, what it does, it acts as a, a nitroglycerin and it expands vasodilates. And then, on top of that, it forces greater heart contraction so you, that you have more force of pressure that can go around the clot. So it's working on multiple actions. But with uh, ischemic stroke, 
Isn't it that there's two kinds of stroke? Right? Yeah, you have, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the right. Ischemic stroke and That's right. stroke. That's right. So with ischemic stroke, how does it still the same? It dilates the, 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 yeah. the artery or something? Look, it's working on both. This is the beauty about it. It's working on both areas. Either way, it's gonna work. either way it falls, yeah. it's working. It's working to enrich the ox the oxygen, the blood, the blood getting there, and it's also helping patch up what damage is being done. It's helping the blood vessel to dilate. And look, you can you can have a heart attack. And if you've got capillary strength, see when your heart stops beating, your capillaries are still working for you. Did you know that? that they are keeping the blood flowing even though the heart is not pushing that. And if you can move the capillary, if you can get those capillaries to do their work better of systemic blood flow, even though the heart itself is stopped, you've got a greater chance of living. If you get to the emergency, I'm not saying this is a substitute for calling 911, I'm not saying that we, you know, we shouldn't intervene the other way, but look, you've got eight minutes at the most. Usually six minutes, brain dead, six, seven minutes. So you, you know, you've got to use something quick. You talk about a stroke. Yeah, heart attack, well actually mainly, mainly a heart attack. Stroke, it depends on the severity of it, but um, with a heart attack you've got six to eight minutes. So, why not have some cayenne on hand mm -hmm. to deal with it? Yeah, right. take it with you. You never know when there's emergency. That's the thing about emergencies. There's no warning, right? It just happens. Yeah. Okay. One last question. <laughs> what about cooking with it? I learned cooking with it. Recommend it to cook with. Okay, I want to explain something. There's a difference between taking something medicinally and taking something as a condiment. For, I mean, I'm not saying you can't use it. I'm just saying um, use it judiciously, you know. And I wouldn't use foods and, and yeah, if you're using a spice that is, you know, you get some of these curries and things that just like you can hardly breathe. They're so hot. So take the milder cayenne if you're going to take it in a dietary form. Use the stronger cayenne for medicinal purposes. Okay, let's, uh, let's close with a word of prayer. And uh, if you'd like to bow your heads with me. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you so much for these simple remedies that when used intelligently, by faith, produce supernatural results. Lord, we thank you. We pray that you'll help us to, to grasp a deeper understanding on how these things work and to be able to help as many people as you bring our way. And we thank you, Lord, for all these blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.